All right, uh, thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, it's fun to be here and see a lot of uh, familiar faces and new faces. Um, I encourage you to come talk to me. My collaborators, Phil Chang, uh, student Matthias Raves, who's working on the supernova mechanism now. My former advisor and John Ahrens, who many of you know, bellowed from the back of the room, your eternal advisor. <laughs> and so, uh, you will, you may or may not notice some similarities in delivery between me and uh, Adam Burroughs. <laughs> All right, so I want to focus on uh, three questions, uh, which I'll try to, um, I'll try to do. So somehow, collapse of these massive stars, um, which is initiated by the Chandrasekhar instability or something like it, um, leads to explosion, um, at least sometimes. And how do we know that? Um, well, we know for a variety of reasons. The great thing about supernovae, they connect to every. Um, part of astrophysics, the dispersal of the elements, in particular helium, carbon, oxygen, magnesium, and iron. This particular picture of Cassé shows silicon, kind of the origin of uh, this famous quote by Carl Sagan, which is worth watching on YouTube if you haven't. His, uh, the way he uh, says it is quite Carl Sagan-y. Um, I like to tell popular audiences that I also, I like to say, have you ever heard of the rule of threes? You know you can live with three weeks without food. Three days without water, three minutes without air, and three seconds without hope. <laughs> and for the first three of those, uh, you need oxygen. <laughs> you know, some of your favorite things, like C6H1206, um, come uh, from supernovae. So that's one reason to be interested in supernovae is because, uh, without exaggeration, they're the origin of you know sort of everything you've ever known or cared about. Um, supernovae also produce neutron stars in all of their glory. Um, and they also produce the energy uh, momentum return to the ISM, uh, which Eve and Evan and many people um, over uh, in Peyton and here are interested in, including myself, about how galaxies um, like um, the northern dwarf galaxy M82 shown here uh, drive large scale outflows we think are largely the product of supernova explosions. So what do we see when we look at supernovae? We see all kinds of things. There's a huge observational phenomenology, um, which I'm not going to go into. There are type twos, which are hydrogen rich. We know that they originate from sort of 8 to 15 solar masses. We see pre-explosion imaging of some progenitors, famously 87A. There are type 1Bs, type 1Cs with no hydrogen. There are broadline 1Cs, which are associated with GRBs. There's superluminous supernovae, which are up to 10 to the 52 ergs radiated, even though normally we only see a paltry 10 to the 49 ergs. So there's many different types of supernovae, some of which I'm going to come back to. Specifically, I'm going to come back to GRBs and superluminous supernovae. There are neutron stars with a huge range of magnetic fields from teragauss to 1,000 teragauss with space velocities ranging from sort of normal star space velocities to thousands of kilometers per second, and spin periods ranging from 10 to 300 milliseconds, but in some cases among the magnetars, the, stars, the neutron stars with the largest magnetic fields, um, the slowest spin rates. The goals, well, there are many goals, but I listed two here. One is to understand the complete causal mapping uh, between progenitors and outcomes, e.g. 87A. You see 87A, you see it explode, and you try to understand. Another one is to understand the nature of explosions and all their diversity and all the amplifications um, of that statement. So I want to take you through uh, these three pieces I've highlighted. And to do that, I need to tell you a little bit about the supernova story. And so this is, a, this is an old graphic I dug up from uh, my PhD days. So you have a progenitor. There's hydrogen, iron, silicon, and so on. Um, it encounters something like the Chandrasekhar instability in the center. There's electron capture onto the um, nuclei. There's instability, and the system collapses. So those 10 to the million years of trying to maintain hydrostatic equilibrium, um, you know, just like you're trying to stand up every day, um, you eventually fail. Um, the star eventually fails, uh, falls inwards at its local dynamical time, um, collapses in about a tenth of a second, the iron core does. When that happens, this reaction, these two reactions, but this one, electron capture on proton, produces neutron. And this is, this is how neutron stars get made. And this is why one of the reasons they're such a produ productive source um, of neutrinos. Somehow that collapse is halted. It's halted by the strong nuclear force. Sometimes you'll hear that collapse is halted by um, degeneracy pressure. Um, but it's not. It's halted by the strong, uh, uh, the hardcore repulsion 
of the strong nuclear force. That produces a shock wave, which then has to propagate outwards, disassemble the star, and so on. That process of the shock stalling takes about a millisecond. Shock revival before black hole formation is typically said to be about a second. If you have a massive star, like a 15 solar mass star, and it collapses, you've only got a certain amount of time to initiate an explosion before a black hole will form. We see neutron stars in the universe, so we know that at least some stars have to explode. After the system explodes, the neutron star is left here, and it drives a wind uh, from its surface, which will be the focus um, of sort of the second half of what I'm going to discuss. So here's a movie. Burroughs, 1995. <laughs> I dug this up from the last millennium. And what you see is the inner 300, solar, uh, 300 kilometers um, of a star in a wedge. This is a two-dimensional simulation. It's a plot of YE, um, and it's great. It's very pedagogical. I show it a lot. Um, and I'll just show you the evolution. You're seeing about 0.4 um, or so seconds of total evolution. And so we'll start again. It'll all be orange, and you'll see the collapse. The electron fraction. Yeah. So it should restart. OK, here it is. Collapse. Boom. There's bounce. This is the formation of the neutron star. There's the shock wave. It doesn't make it all the way out because of neutrino losses. Then there are neutrinos streaming through here because this is super hot, tens of MeV. Neutrinos are being produced by that reaction. Some of those neutrinos are interacting with this me medium outside and driving convection. It's a spherical pot, and then it explodes. And when it does, the matter wants to fall back, but it's pushed out by a wind, a thermal wind. Whoosh. No, it is not radiation pressure. So where's Michael? Um, <laughs> it's not radiation pressure. That's important. Um, radiation pressure, uh, the, the Eddington luminosity uh, for neutrinos is around 10 to the 57 or so ergs per second. But the neutrino luminosity here is a paltry 10 to the 52. So it's several decades below um, the Eddington limit. And so what's actually happening is energy deposition. What's happening is you're having very hot electron neutrinos being emitted from the medium and are absorbed by neutrons and produce a hot electron that's then thermalized in the medium basically instantaneously. So just here's a time steady version from another paper from the last millennium, is that you have the mass flux falling in, you have a shock, you have neutrinos coming from your proto-neutron star that are being absorbed, and it's a spherical hot pot uh, that's accreting, um, and maybe uh, it eventually explodes. So here's something from this millennium. This is a simulation uh, by uh, Vartanian, uh, Radice, um, Burroughs, and others here. Um, and it's very pretty. And so it shows the birth of a neutron star. Here you're seeing entropy contours, but it doesn't make a difference. I just want you to see a three-dimensional version. And it explodes. Very nice. So the question I'm interested in asking is why do some calculations fail while others succeed? I just showed you several versions that succeeded. Yay, but if you've heard anything about supernovae over the last three or four decades, um, you've heard that many of the calculations fail. Um, and in fact, one-dimensional simulations fail. That was my thesis. My thesis was to show that one-dimensional simulations fail and that models of the R process fail. And I succeeded in showing that both fail. Uh, it worked out for the best, uh, but supernovae generally fail, and a lot of these simulations do fail. They collapse, um, they continue to accrete, and a black hole forms. In fact, I showed you the one uh, Vartanian um, et al. Uh, explosion, but just the other day by Sean Couch and Evan O'Connor, um, there were a bunch of simulations posted in which many of them, um, all of them, uh, failed to explode. And yet, we observe explosions in nature. And so the thing I was interested in is why do some calculations fail while others succeed? And why do supernovae explode? Or another way to put it is how is explosion triggered? You saw that thing, that object that I showed you in the orange in the YE movie from the Burroughs 1995. It wiggled, it wiggled, it wiggled, and then all of a sudden it went. Why did it go is the question. Now usually what you hear in the literature is that physical effect X caused more heating and it was enough. And so I was interested in a more detailed exploration of that, that statement. 
I wanted to know but physically why, and I think you might be unsatisfied uh, with the final answer, but I'll still tell you where we are. This talk is a little bit different than a lot of other talks in the sense that I'm going to be here for a year, and I've decided to highlight three projects that I'm working on right now, uh, which don't necessarily have a final answer. Um, so there are some differences uh, with typical. So it won't be a, a triumphant, um, you know, trumpets will not blare at the end. <laughs> the thing I was specifically interested in is this thing called the critical luminosity. So Adam rears his head again. Burroughs and Gashi in 1993 showed something very important, I think, for the supernova uh, literature. I said that after a core collapses, matter falls in. It falls in because there's no pressure support. Once the iron core collapses, then the inner parts fall in, fall in, fall in. And if there's no explosion, they just fall in and make a black hole. But what happens is that a star is very dense on the inside and not very dense on the outside. And so what happens is the accretion rate onto this baby neutron star, this thing that might become a black hole, decreases with time. So this is m dot, is the mass accretion rate onto the star, onto the neutron star, from the inner iron core. And it starts a very big number, one solar mass per second. Big number, maybe even two solar masses per second, three solar masses per second. Once this thing collapses, that movie that I showed you only went 300 milliseconds, the thing collapses, matter's falling down, starts at one solar mass per second, and then in time, it evolves to lower accretion rates. And somewhere along the line, it has to explode if it's going to make a supernova. Okay? So for a 15 solar mass star that's collapsing, it might start at two solar masses, and then half a second later, two solar masses per second, and then half a second later, it might be at 0.3 or something, just to make up some numbers. So what Burroughs and Gashi showed is that at a given m dot, Take any m dot you like, let's say this one, 0.2 solar masses per second. That represents some amount of time after collapse. Let me set up a condition where I have a neutron star sitting there, and it's radiating neutrinos. And let me see if I can find a steady state accretion solution at that m dot. So they started here, and they said, well, at 0.2 solar masses per second, and this low neutrino luminosity, this tiny little fraction of 10 to the 52 ergs per second, I find accretion, and I find a shock that's sitting there at, let's say, 100 kilometers. Then if I increase the luminosity, I still find accretion. If I increase the luminosity, I still find accretion. If I increase the luminosity to here, I still find accretion. If I go beyond that, there's no accretion solution. Yes? So why does the shock wave when it want, why does the shock wave initially stall? The shock wave initially stalls for a combination of reasons, but mostly neutrino losses, that there's all this neutrino radiation, but there's also photo disintegration across the shock. There's that. Um, and then there's just the ram pressure of the material falling in. That's right. So the matter comes in, hits the shock and then travels down through here. And this is the region where there's mostly cooling, and this is the region where there's mostly heating. That's right. Right, artificially from the core. So you just say, forget all these details. Forget it. I have a neutron star seeing this in. I have some shock. I have a bunch of matter falling in at some rate, specified m dot. I have a core of neutrinos that's being radiated, that's also specified. If I can find a shock and everything's stable and everything's fine and we can satisfy the equations of time steady hydrodynamics with optically thin heating and cooling, let me put a dot, 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 no dot. And do it again at a higher m dot and a lower m dot. Okay. Assume spherical symmetry and time steady. That's right. It's not. That's right. It is part determined by the accretion rate, but it's also determined by the fact that you've taken all this binding energy and stored it in a neutron star that's optically thick. So the neutrino luminosity is a complicated thing. It depends both on the accretion rate and it depends on the energy that's kind of getting out of the neutron star. This, in this simplified problem, there's this core neutrino luminosity that's specified and m dot which is coming in. 
the neutron star, for the purposes of this calculation, has a mass and a radius. So why do supernovae explode? The answer would be, why do supernovae not explode? The answer would be that, boom, the thing collapses, and it's one solar mass per second, let's say, and it's up here, and it goes and forms a black hole. Why does a supernova explode? It starts here and it goes zip, zipping across here, crosses the critical neutrino luminosity, um, and explodes. So what is the physics of L-crit? People would say, Model X did not explode. It must have had insufficient neutrino heating. That is, L was below this L-crit. It was down here somewhere. Did not explode. Whereas Model Y explodes. It must have had sufficient neutrino heating. This is typically what people say. That's true. The statement is spherical. True that the statement is spherical. So what we wanted to do is try to understand this further because I was still unhappy um, with this statement. I was still unhappy that this model has big enough neutrino luminosity that exceeds this critical luminosity. Okay? And so the system did not did explode, whereas this model did not explode. The issue was what <laughs> physics? Yeah, go ahead. Yep. You mean m dot yeah, by itself? Yeah. yeah. It would be it would be below. You mean well instantaneous? What do you mean by instantaneous? You mean if I just said g m m dot over r equal to l nu? It would be similar. Similar. Same order of magnitude. Okay. Where am I going with this? Where I'm going is that we decided to simplify the problem even further. Okay. Even further. So we decided to model this complex situation with mass flux coming in, a shock, heating, and cooling with a set, set central gravitational potential. Um, with the simplest model problem we could possibly write down. And the simplest model problem we could possibly write down is that you have cold, pressureless freefall landing on a shock wave, and then you have material that's hot and slow and of some specified sound speed accreting slowly onto the neutron star. This model problem looks a little bit like this if I take a slice out of this and just plot the velocity. As a function of radius, velocity here, you have matter falling in, falling in, falling in, falling in, shocks, and then goes through this hot, slow um, contraction onto the neutron star here at 10 kilometers. Okay. And so what we decided to do was write down the steady state Euler equations for spherical flow with some specified sound speed behind the shock and ask, is the origin of this critical neutrino luminosity actually coming from the fact that you can't support accretion above a certain thermal content of the matter. And what you find, if you write this down, if you say, this matter is cold pressureless freefall falling in at this velocity, it shocks, and then the thermal state here is maintained by some agent. I'm not going to specify. I'm just going to say it has constant CT. And what you find is a very interesting uh, thing. You can make a plot of the radius. This is distance from the neutron star. It's scaled in some funny way with the sound speed. And you can plot the Mach number. So this is the velocity of the material in this way. And what you find if you write down the shock jump conditions is that the shock can only exist along this one locus in space. That is. The accretion velocity just after the shock has to be on this locus. Everything falls into some radius. Then there's a shock. Then in the post-shock medium, there's a specified version of CT. And this is the Mach number. And so if you put in a single sound speed and you solve this equation, you get this. Here's a tiny little CT. What does this little bitty, cute little line here mean? 
it means that this big dot is the neutron star radius for some specified neutron star radius and some specified neutron star mass. And this velocity right there is the accretion flow that's going from the shock, which can only exist at the red curve, to the neutron star. So the matter lands at the shock and then accretes. So this is radius. You can imagine the matter's falling in, shocks, and then goes to this position, joins the shock, and then slowly accretes down onto the neutron star. If you do that with higher value of CT, higher value of CT, higher value of the sound speed, higher value of the sound speed, you get this different locus, and the neutron star radius is moving because this thing is, is uh, defined in terms of the sound speed. So the neutron star radius is moving out. Again, what is this line? It's the Mach number, the velocity of accretion as it goes from the shock to the neutron star for a specified value of CT. Higher CT, higher CT, higher CT, higher CT, higher CT. What's happening is that the shock radius is moving out, and the accretion flow is becoming more extended. Here's the neutron star radius. Here's the shock radius until finally you miss. So what we found is that there is no shock solution for high enough CT, and there are shock solutions for all lower values of CT. No, no. There are no neutrinos in this problem. It's a spherical, idealized problem. For a critical value of the CT, the sound speed in the medium, it is impossible to satisfy both the shock jump conditions, which is this locus, and the conditions on the fluid equations for time steady flow. Where were you talking about um, I have a plot with Bondi accretion. Um, Bondi accretion comes, has finite pressure, right, at infinity, comes in through a sonic point, and then settles. Um, does it does not have this shock solution in it, so it doesn't cross the, it does cross probably this locus, but it doesn't have a meaning in that sense. So it's, not one of the no it's not one of the no shock solutions. It shouldn't be, necessarily. They wouldn't be straight. That's right. They would have a complicated shape because of neutrino heating and cooling, because of the equation of state, because of various different things. That's right. All of those things are true. I'm just trying to illustrate a f so, so what we did is we first did this, which I can actually show you, OK? And what you find is that this number is CT squared over VS squared squared at the shock is 3 sixteenths. It's not the 3 sixteenths that you sometimes encounter in shock literature, different 3 sixteenths. Anyway, this is once exceeded, the system must make this time-dependent transition. And Jim will say, and other people will say, well, what about a gamma law equation of state? Or what about adiabatic compression? Or what about all those things? You can redo the problem with a more general equation of state. You can redo the problem with full neutrino heating and cooling. You can redo the problem with a general equation of state, and you will still get the basic answer. will be the same. That, in those cases, I would rewrite CT squared as CS squared. But CS squared over V escape squared will be a number beyond which, if it is bigger than that, you cannot simultaneously satisfy the shock jump conditions and the downstream time-steady Euler equations. And because of that, something has to happen. Right. Right. So why am I neglecting angular momentum again? Um, because I'm just trying to show you the simplest possible case. This thing, right? Sorry. So this thing, so we have just recently repeated the same calculation in the radial coordinate with rotation. And you can write down a general expression that looks like this in the limit v phi. Well, I'll leave it as CT. So this can be generalized to with rotation. So it's a fundamental property of accretion flow. It's a fundamental property of time-steady accretion flows that there's only a certain amount of thermal energy, not surprisingly, you can support behind the shock. Michael? Yes. You're right. They're not. I'm doing that because we checked, and it does. But I'll, I'll sh and, and I'll, I'll, show you, I'll show you that. So this number, 3 sixteenths. Um, and we can write down a critical curve. And the critical curve looks like the neutrino-driven critical curve. And Michael, when we do time-dependent simulations, 
where here you're seeing the accretion flow. This is distance. This is work just recently done by Matthias. You see the material falling in at free fall, then shocking, and then accreting onto the neutron star. And as we exceed the antisonic limit, this antisonic condition, what happens is you see a time-dependent transition to a forward shock moving out and a wind, actually, that's emerging into that. And so here, this is early time, this is later time, you see a supersonic wind hitting a forward shock. And so what you see is a wind-driven bubble. You see a forward shock, a reverse shock, and a wind-driven bubble that's very much analogous um, to uh, what you would see, say, from a massive star in the interstellar medium. So when you exceed this condition, generally defined, I showed you the special case of s constant CT behind the shock. When you exceed it, you undergo a time-dependent transition to a thermal wind. And this has been seen in simulations all the way back to the 90s. In some of those, in fact, um, in those wind-driven, uh, in the model I showed you, um, you see a thermal wind um, driving a wind-driven bubble. And so that's what a supernova is. A supernova is a wind-driven bubble in a massive star. It is a wind driven by neutrino heating. That is what an explosion is in the massive star context. What I'm saying is that there is a locus for any given m dot if you have more energy uh, than you can have behind the shock in order to satisfy the boundary conditions, then you explode. Where that is now, that, whereas that is now extremely well defined, at least in the case of CT squared, in the case of an isothermal sound, in the I came case of an isothermal medium. It's this number, 3 sixteenths. For a shock bounded accretion flow. Yep, Alan? Well, the shock sets the boundary conditions here. You have to obey the strong shock conditions here. And at least for if you're writing down time steady, then you have to have a time steady accretion flow here. Once you've exceeded this, you have to look for some other time independent solution or if nothing else is changing. And that time independent solution, at least here, is the Parker wind, basically. Parker wind. And this is the, the transient thing uh, that is driven out as the system uh, adjust from one time independent solution to another time independent solution. Eve? The, well, the, the medium falling in is cold. The medium behind the shock is not. Is the behind the shock. Behind the shock. Say it again. So I am allowing, I'm giving myself the freedom to choose the downstream enthalpy. It's not self-consistent in the sense of all three shock conditions because I'm adding it in by hand. I'm putting it in by hand. In a real situation, sorry, go ahead. Right, a real situation, a real situation, this post-shock medium would be determined by neutrino heating and cooling and so on. It would have some thermal profile which I can show you the full solutions, but this is the simpler one. And what happens then is that as the medium expands, the wind is driven, the wind is driven outwards by neutrino heating. So is the antisonic condition the answer to anything? Objection number one would be you need real physics. If you want to say why did a model explode, you would first need to say we well, need real physics. And the, our first answer to that is, well, when we do one-dimensional models with real physics, the condition is unchanged. The physics of the condition is unchanged. If the thermal content behind the shock is bigger than a number, which is this antisonic ratio, then the medium transitions to thermal wind. That is, the pressure is too large. Objection number two is that, but didn't you see those movies? <laughs> is Vartanian here? Is Vartanian? Vartanian would be like, didn't you see those movies? None of that stuff is happening. 
Um, they're three-dimensional, they're time-dependent, there's convection, and so on. Now, my hypothesis, which I'm working on right now, is that a version of this, which I haven't written here, but I have in my mind, um, is, uh, might actually persist. So I'm interested in new uh, interrogations of the theoretical models that might show that something like this basic physics is underlying the beautiful uh, simulations um, that uh, David and others have produced. So my current work is to try to idealize those cases, or understand those cases. And rotation, as um, Rashid asked, um, that can be derived analytically and easy for the case, easily for the case of, um, for, the, for, the, for that case, for the 1D case. V phi has to be less than CT. Well, so new stars are rapidly rotating, but the vast majority of supernova theorists would say that rotation is not very important for the supernova mechanism because we think that neutron stars are born slowly rotating with respect to breakup. So, uh, yeah, so there could be, if they're rapidly rotating, there could be a disk. And then we would not be in this limit. I'm in the, I'm talking about this limit. Yep. Okay. So it's a partial answer. You could say, oh, well, what sets CT? Well, there might be new physics. Like, for example, uh, simulations of uh, David and others would say, oh, well, there are, there are new physics inside the neutron star that increases the neutrino luminosity, which increases the neutrino heating rate. And I would say, great, that's the antisonic condition. What happens is that you heat the matter more. Uh, others would say, well, it's the convection. The convection is driving turbulent motion, so you're putting some of that thermal energy into convection, and that's affecting the boundary conditions of the problem. And I would say, I actually think I can incorporate that here into this understanding. Adam is skeptical, but I remain a Boolean as always. <laughs> you don't need to say anything. <laughs> My spidey sense tells me. Hypothetically. Force space. Uh, I have not looked into the dimensionality of the three sixteenths. I can tell you that spherically, I get three sixteenths. We can we can derive it later. Okay. Yeah. No. I showed your movies. I showed your movies, which showed the um, the explosion with the uh, continued accretion. And absolutely, the continued accretion is interesting because the continued accretion will partially set the neutrino luminosity, which powers the explosion. Absolutely. No, I, yeah, but David's asking, he's asking a different, different question. All right, so winds drive explosion. Jim, did you want to ask one more question about that? Yep, that's right. per unit time. That's obvious, but I still want to understand the physics. And the best that I can tell you, I have told you my simplest version of that. It could be phrased that way, but I have not found a suitably simple way to phrase it. Yes, true. Well, the simp that, yeah, I can't remember exactly. I think the 3 sixteenths comes from gamma squared times gamma minus 1 over gamma plus 1. Somebody will correct it, plus 1 squared. Um, that's where 3 sixteenths comes from in the limit. Gamma goes to 5 thirds. Anyway, um, they're, they're physically different. Uh huh. That's right. I well, it's the bind. I. It wouldn't be obvious that that's when you get a wind when there's m dot falling on you. 
I, I, we, we could argue about it. I'm just telling you this is the solution. We can, we can derive it on the board if you want. Uh, but it's good. It's good to think about all those things. I, I don't mean to cut off discussion. I want to come back to it. When these things explode, uh, they don't explode very well. Um, they don't get very much energy. Uh, the supernovae go off. The winds drive this explosion, which I've said is a wind-driven bubble propagating into the star. The duration of that wind-driven bubble is uh, not very long. And the reason is, is that the mass loss rate in this wind, as was done by Chin and Woosley, the mass loss rate in this wind starts off at about 10 to the minus 4 or so solar masses per second. It seems big, but it doesn't last for very long, a second or two. And then it decays very rapidly. The neutrino luminosity is decreasing. We know that from 1987A. We know that from all the models. Neutrino luminosity decreases as a function of time. The m dot in the wind decreases as a function of time. And the total energy that comes out is a few uh, by 10 to the 50 ergs. The velocity is about 0.1c. The interest of these winds at late times as the neutron star cools was mostly um, these works starting with Woosley and Hoffman. Woosley in 1994 was as a site uh, of production of our process nuclei. You have a neutron star. It's ablating material from its surface. Um, maybe you could form the R process. Here's just another movie from this one from Scheck. It's two-dimensional. There's entropy. Um, there's log density. The thing's accreting. There's a shock wave. And what you're going to see at the end is just the wind-driven bubble moving into that. And it's just, again, to show you that this is a wind-driven phenomenon. So there you can see uh, the wind-driven bubble uh, emerging from the neutron star and pushing on uh, the classic reverse shock, forward shock, contact discontinuity uh, structure. That's how supernovae happen. But the energies are low. Every time you do these calculations, the energies are low. The neutrino energies are a few times 10 to the 50, maybe 5 times 10 to the 50, maybe 10 to the 51. Maybe. But we see explosions that are much more energetic than that. So enter long duration GRBs. We see explosions of energy 10 to the 51 to 10 to the 52 ergs, duration 10 to 100 seconds. They're relativistic. They have jets. They come with peculiar high energy uh, supernova explosions. The actual emission mechanism for the gamma rays remains debated. Sorry. One point four solar masses. Ten to fifty-three point five. Eventually, that's right. All of that comes out in neutrinos uh, at, on some time scale, and L is about one over T. So in log space um, over. 100 seconds, um, it's evenly distributed. Well, if you, but you still have to couple it to the matter. So it doesn't matter if the energy comes out. Yeah. So GRBs happen. You know about GRBs. You've heard about them many times. The overall rate is small, but these peculiar 1C explosions are very energetic. So we know about long duration GRBs. They look like supernovae, um, except they have relativistic jets. And their total energies are much higher than neutrino heating could ever produce, I think. Meanwhile, superluminous supernovae are discovered in blind searches by Quimby um, and collaborators back in 2007. They found 2005 AP, um, a stripped envelope, extremely bright supernova with luminosity 10 to even 1,000 times the luminosity of normal supernovae with implied energies that were very, very high. Assassin, which I'm a member of, the All Sky Automated Search for Supernovae, found this very enigmatic and interesting event. Assassin 2015 LH, which is the most luminous supernova, if it's a supernova, it's the most luminous supernova ever. There's some debate about whether it's a tidal disruption event. This one radiated 10 to the 52 ergs. Radiated 10 to the 52 ergs, 1,000 times more than normal, peaked at an absolute uh, magnitude of minus 23 and a half. So the question. I mean, in photons, we saw that much energy. In optical, but with UV corrections, there was very good spectral coverage. So I would say we would say quasi-bolometric is what we would say, with all the caveats implied by that. So what causes supernovae of much larger energy than typical? If neutrino heating can't do it, what could? Well, you know, the jury is not out on neutrino heating. There are some contexts in which things could be done, but I remain very skeptical that you're ever going to be able to power 10 to the 52 erg explosions. So how do you get more power into this bubble? How do you get more energy into a wind-blown bubble? Enter rotation and magnetic field. 
So I love this picture of these pictures of the sun because they're beautiful, but also this is an evident this is an example of a magnetically dominated um, thermal wind, and that's what I want to talk about, a magnetically dominated thermal wind. It would also imagine that the thing is rotating very rapidly. So where can our energy come from? Our energy could come from rotation. Okay? At 2 by 10 to the 50 ergs, with a spin period of just 10 milliseconds, we're already in the range where we're close to the neutrino total amount of energy that neutrinos will produce in some of these simulations. The neutrinos will drive in kinetic energy. If we could somehow make this, say, 3 milliseconds, 2 by 10 to the 51, 1 millisecond, 2 by 10 to the 52, if we could tap this rotational energy, um, then we would be able to drive very energetic explosions. So now you imagine the star sitting there driving a wind-blown bubble, but there's a huge uh, magnetocentrifugally accelerated wind um, that comes off the surface. And the first question you immediately ask is, can we in fact tap rotational energy? It probably wouldn't surprise anybody that things could be rapidly rotating. After all, massive stars on the main sequence are rapidly rotating, but we don't understand angular momentum in stars as they evolve, and many neutron stars um, are not born with millisecond spin period. Still, we observe explosions that are 10 to 52 ergs, period. So we need to explain them. How are we going to do it? I don't think you can do it with neutrinos. So rotation and magnetic fields um, have been described for some time, 50 years. Uh, people have been using rotation and magnetic fields to do things like this. Maybe we can do it in this context. The question is, how big would B need to be? And this gives you a plot of that. So what you do is you take a neutron star wind. This is actually a profile of a neutron star wind. So here's pressure. This is P in log units, some big CGS unit, doesn't matter. Here is the neutron star surface, 10 kilometers. Here's an exponential profile and then the wind coming off of it, pressure as a function of distance. And here is the wind at early times, like two seconds after the explosion, three seconds, four seconds, 10 seconds, 20 seconds after explosion. 30 seconds, 40 seconds, 50 seconds, 100 seconds after explosion, the pressure profile decreases because the neutron star is cooling. The neutron star is cooling because it's emitting neutrinos, and its luminosity is decreasing and decreasing and decreasing. Well, if you just overlay b squared over 8 pi for a 10 to the 16 Gauss dipole, 10 to the 15 Gauss dipole, 10 to the 14, and 10 to the 13, you immediately see that as the neutron star cools from 2 seconds down to 20 seconds, if the magnetic field is bigger than 10 to the 14 Gauss, then that will dominate the dynamics, will dominate the wind dynamics. And why is that important? Because we observe 10 to the 14 Gauss magnetic fields in nature. We observe, we have very good evidence to support um, 10 to the 14 Gauss fields or larger um, on the surfaces of some neutron star. So what's going to happen if the thing rotates? So now we have a wind. We posit the existence of a large-scale dipole field, and we rotate it. And what happens to the wind? If we want more power, we get more power. If you put a bead on this wire, and you do this, you accelerate it to very high velocity. If my arm is even stronger, if the, this is even longer, then we could very easily accelerate to the speed of light, or nearly the speed of light. Okay? If you imagine me rotating with an angular frequency of say 6,000 radians per second, and my arm is very strong, like 49 kilometers, then uh, that's a funny story. Actually, I almost took Steve Beckwith's head off at SDSCI um, because they have a really huge pointer at SDSCI. And anyway, I got a little carried away. It happens to me. So stage one is that the neutron star is produced. Here it is viewed from the top. There's material flowing out. And the B field forces the wind into co-rotation out to the alphane point. And since I'm here, I especially want to give uh, people who haven't looked at it, they should look at every Schatzman's paper from 1962, which I believe was written here, um, but others can correct me, um, which was the first statement that if you have a wind and a large-scale magnetic field, you will get very strong angular momentum transport. Very strong. So all statements about things spinning down and sp with uh, magnetic fields and outflows originate here, as far as I know. Um, every shot in the 1962, in which he refers to his IAU symposium abstract from 1959. Say it again. 67? 67, 67, 67, excuse me. Yeah, I, I dropped it off there. 67. Now, my neutrino luminosity is decreasing because my neutron star is cooling, and so this alphane radius is going to increase in time. The wind will become relativistic. 
what we have done is a whole bunch of stuff. So for 20 years or so now, 15 years, I've been working on this. We did 1D equatorial non-relativistic winds, 2D axisymmetric relativistic winds, a bunch of beautiful work by Bucchiantini. And what do we find? This is what we find. Here is a neutron star sitting in the center. This is relativistic MHD. The wind is being driven out along the equatorial plane. This is 2D axisymmetry, and actually it's done in a, um, um, in a wedge. So excuse me, but Bucchiantini flipped it four times. And so this is symmetric here. And what you see is actually the wind comes flying in here, produces a shock wave, which produces these big rolls in 2D axisymmetry, which then produce um, a big pointing flux dominated jet. So what we find, all this work, is that we get a very efficient spin down mechanism. If the spin period is less than two milliseconds, and if B is big, bigger than 10 to the 15 Gauss, then this wind drives a relativistic jet with very high magnetization, it becomes relativistic. With 10 to the 50 ergs per second now, we can get very high energies on one to hundreds of second time scales. And the energy is very efficiently channeled um, into this jet mechanism here, um, which goes up. And that jet is produced uh, by the hoop stress in the magnetic field. And this is very similar to classic calculations by Biznavati, Kogan, LeBlanc, and Wilson, um, and others. I want to finish uh, with nucleosynthesis. One word about nucleosynthesis. This is a new um, idea. As many of you may know, um, the origin of the R process is unknown. I used to say is unknown, but now everybody thinks it's known because everybody thinks the R process comes from neutron star merger. So when you look at the periodic table of elements, um, iron is not very high, not as high as you would think. And the elements above iron on the periodic table, most of them are produced by neutron capture. And the R process elements, shown here for this star, CS2289052052, an ultra metal poor halo star, um, match in relative abundance, europium, cadmium, samarium, and so on, the scaled solar R process. And so this has been observed for some time that as you look out into the universe, you see R process elements, notably, the one that's talked about the most is europium, because it's the easiest to see, is that the um, R process seems to produce whatever, whatever is making the R process happens at very early times in the history um, of uh, our halo and has enriched um, ultra metal poor sites, uh, ultra metal poor stars um, with heavy elements in the same abundance ratio um, as is observed for the sun, at least through the lanthanides um, and into the actinides. And now the big news from last year, of course, is that neutron star neutron star mergers seem to, although there's some argument about this, produce these heavy elements in abundance and fling them out into the universe. But before that, people ask the question, could it be these neutron star winds I've been telling you about? After all, the neutron star is sitting there. It's driving an outflow. Maybe that outflow is neutron rich. Maybe um, it could produce uh, the R process. So normal winds, when you try to do that wind calculation, you find that they fail. I told you that I failed multiple times during my PhD. I failed to produce supernovae, and I failed to produce a successful R process. And this was the second one. What we did is we did these calculations of neutron star winds driven by neutrino heating, the neutron star winds I've been telling you about. And they produced a high entropy, relatively neutron rich outflow, but it did not exceed the critical criterion for producing these lanthanides and actinides. It never produced thermodynamic conditions that we needed in order to produce those heavy elements. And so it was a bust. What we found was that neutron star winds could generically produce these things, but they could never produce these things or these things. And the reason why was actually talked about by Hoffman earlier in 1997 is because there's a single figure of merit for producing these lanthanides and actinides that can be written down in terms of the physics of this um, alpha alpha n capture to uh, 12 carbon. That is that this parameter, s cubed over t dynamical over y e to the third power, has to be bigger than this number. And if it's not, then either the entropy is too low, the time scale is too long, or the electron fraction is too high, or some combination. And you'll only produce the first peak you'll not produce the lanthanides or the actinides. 
And so the question is, how would the thermodynamics of the wind, namely the entropy dynamical time scale and yd change um, with rotation and magnetic field? So if you have a rotating magnetic field, and there's matter flying out here, and it's not neutron rich enough, and it's not fast enough, and the entropy is not high enough to produce the R process, would this effect, or some other effect, change the entropy dynamical time scale and yE? Well, the first thing you see is dynamical time. Because if the material is being flung out very rapidly, then the dynamical time decreases. But as the material is flying away from the star, the entropy of the material, since it's not going to be heated enough because it's going to be magnetocentrifugally accelerated, will decrease. And the electron fraction is less obvious. It's less obvious is that the electron fraction will also decrease because as you rotate faster and faster and faster and faster, you begin to basically be ejecting the neutron matter from the surface of the neutron star. And so what we did is a series of calculations where we took the neutron star from 100 radians per second to 1,000 radians per second to 10 to the 4 radians per second. And we asked, how does the entropy of the flow change? How does the dynamical time scale change? And how does YE change? And what we found is that, again, for millisecond spin periods and magnetic field of 10 to the 15 Gauss, which would be rare, um, you exceed this critical criterion and will produce the R process. So, these nucle so the nucleosynthesis might be directly affected by um, rotation and magnetic fields as well. The last thing we checked was this. So here is a dynamical two-dimensional simulation of a non-rotating neutron star that's being heated by neutrinos from below. It's about 10 to the 15. I can't remember whether this simulation, I think this simulation is 10 to 15.5, pretty high. So here's a neutron star, baby neutron star. Big neutrino luminosity drives a wind. But as I told you, a magnetic field of 10 to the 15 Gauss is very strong. And so what does it do? It traps matter. It traps matter in the closed zone, or a helmet streamer type configuration, and allows the matter to be superheated up to an entropy that's very high, in this case 1,200 units. So typically what happens is these winds are flying out, and they only reach an entropy of maybe 100, the free wind, but the trapped wind here, and these little blips, these bubbles, these toroidal plasmoids reach entropies that are very, very high here. And so what Asif and I did uh, just this last year is we did these two-dimensional simulations with neutrino heating and cooling with strong magnetic fields, and we showed that these blobs actually exceed that zeta critical. Because the entropy, because that zeta critical is proportional to entropy to the third power, these blobs exceed that criterion um, and should produce uh, heavy element nucleosynthesis. Whoop. Okay. To conclude, so why do supernovae explode? Well, you know, we're all scientists, so we've committed ourselves to an infinite series of why questions, never to be answered. But so the, <laughs> I think the antisonic condition is an interesting possibility for a type of answer to it, which is to say, as Bruce said, it's obvious that if you heat the matter too much, it expands. It is obvious. Okay? I just wanted to know what too much means, exactly what it means. I want to know why. And the, our development of our understanding of that is still coming. So I think I want to try to extend this to multidimensional time-dependent uh, simulations. And I would like to understand whether or not a condition that looks like this can be written down that will explain why some three-dimensional simulations explode and why others don't. And I think it has to do with this critical separatrix. Um, and I think even though this CT squared over V escape squared is maybe laughably simple, um, it also elucidates, it, it shows you what the basic physics is. So how do we produce very energetic supernovae we see? Um, I think you do it with this magnetocentrifugal wind. I think you get spin down. This is an original idea by Schatzman. 
um, you get big kinetic power. For GRBs, you need 2 milliseconds and 10 to the 15 gauss plus efficient jet production. For superluminous supernovae, you need P less than 10 milliseconds, B bigger than or around 10 to the 13 gauss and efficient thermalization required. What I'm going to be working on here is three-dimensional models in which B dot omega is not equal to 1. These are axisymmetric simulations in which B and omega are in the same direction. I would like to know what the spin down power looks like when B and omega are not aligned. Can the supernova produce the R process? Well, generically, yes, the first peak. If rapid rotation and high B, then third peak, that's in the slinging limit. And if slow rotation and big P, big B, then third peak is also favorable. That's that trapping limit where you see these toroidal plasmoids emerging, superheated toroidal plasmoids emerging like a coronal mass ejection. What are the implications of all this? Well, I think this might help us understand supernovae. This might be important for connecting superluminous supernovae, GRBs, and energetic supernovae. And this might be important for the origin of the elements. That's it. Thanks.